This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is Professor Rogers M. Smith, who is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of numerous books, including Still a House Divided, Race and Politics in Obama's America, and Civic Ideals, Conflicting Visions of Citizenship in U.S. History. Professor Smith is the Jefferson Lecturer on the Berkeley campus this spring. Uh, Professor Smith, welcome to Berkeley. Delighted to be with you. And uh, looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Was there a lot of discussion about politics and, and current events around the dinner table? Yes. Uh, for reasons I don't uh, fully understand, um, in that uh, uh, until I came along, uh, uh, nobody had uh, pursued a career that had that much to do with politics directly. I come from uh, a family of businessmen, teachers, and ministers, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, my brothers, my parents, and I uh, always talked about politics uh, as long as I can remember, and also living in a state capital, uh, I got involved in politics at a very early age. What sorts of politics? Just state politics or civil rights or? Uh, both, really. Uh, when I was uh, 13, uh, my brother and I uh, uh, got friends together and went down to the local Teenage Republican Club and got ourselves elected. Uh, uh, he was president and I was vice president. He <laughs> lost interest, but I continued uh, with the Teenage Republicans, uh, eventually becoming uh, state chairman of the Illinois Teenage Republican Federation. Uh, at the same time, uh, I considered myself from Springfield an Abraham Lincoln Republican who was sympathetic to uh, civil rights, uh, and I did participate in some of the civil rights activities of the 1960s in uh, Illinois. Uh, and these two things eventually proved in tension with each other because the uh, story of the Republican Party in the 1960s is that uh, it turned away uh, from its uh, heritage of being a party of strong national governmental action on behalf of civil rights uh, to uh, embrace of more state rights views and uh, a lot of opposition to civil rights initiatives. And as that went on, um, uh, the more I worked in Republican Party politics in the late 60s, um, uh, uh, the more uh, I realized that um, my politics didn't fit uh, with uh, the way the party was going, uh, and I uh, moved in different political directions. Uh, where did you do your undergraduate work? I went to James Madison College at Michigan State University, and that was a choice reflected by these uh, experiences. I like to say that um, uh, I was um, uh, chairman for Teens for Nixon in the state of Illinois in 1968, and in the next few years, I came to question whether I had an adequate understanding of politics. <laughs> um, and James Madison College was a program set up in the middle 1960s that was uh, uh, a small residential college within a state university uh, with faculty hired primarily as teachers and primarily concerned with political philosophy and history. And I felt I needed to find an atmosphere where I had a lot of freedom to think about big questions of basic political principle and purpose because I was questioning everything I'd mm -hmm. grown up believing in and had worked actively on in my teen years. And I saw in that environment uh, a place where um, uh, I could do that, and it was uh, uh, very formative for me. I uh, realized that, um, uh, for better or worse, um, uh, I had a greater passion for um, 
studying, thinking, and writing about politics uh, than doing politics, and so I became a uh, uh, professor as a result of having gone there. Yeah, so, so it sounds like that, that you, you were living a life uh, uh, between uh, 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 theory and practice, or at least you were practicing it, and, and that, that really pushed you to see the importance of thinking about it. And, yes, practice drove me to theory, absolutely. Yeah, right. And where did you do your graduate work? Harvard University. And uh, who were your mentors there, and then what did you do your dissertation on? Uh, my mentor was Judith Sklar, my thesis supervisor, uh, who was a uh, political uh, theorist uh, originally from uh, Latvia who had uh, fled both Stalinist and um, Hitler's tyranny in Europe and um, uh, went on to be educated first in Canada and then uh, at Harvard herself and uh, who, um, uh, even though she was a great expert on the grand European thinkers, uh, her interests were turning increasingly toward American political thought uh, because she uh, felt that it represented a body of reflection on trying to operate uh, institutions of self-governance that was the most extensive that we had in the world. And uh, my interests uh, were to try to um, explore uh, what were the sources of what I saw as wrong in American politics um, and what might be better uh, directions. And uh, so she was a great person for me to work with, and she was a just marvelous teacher and thesis supervisor um, and became a great friend. Uh, I wrote my dissertation uh, on, um, it was called Liberalism in American Constitutional Law, also my first book, uh, because I was concerned that a lot of the discussion of constitutional issues didn't grasp the contestation and transformations in uh, American political thought, broader American political principles over time, and I wanted to show how constitutional development uh, had been shaped by uh, problems in the uh, uh, prevailing principles of public philosophy with which the nation had began and how uh, constitutional doctrines often reflected uh, very different visions that had come to the fore uh, subsequently. And as I worked on it, I also felt well, now I know out of these different traditions that have shaped America uh, which way I want to go. And so uh, the last part of the uh, dissertation and book uh, argue more normatively uh, for a certain understanding of American constitutionalism and the directions uh, in which it should go. Uh, I don't agree with everything I wrote then, but it did help um, resolve some of these uh, uh, really painful um, uncertainties that I'd formed through my teen years and gave me a sense of what I was for. And you gravitated towards subjects of uh, constitutional law, citizenship, uh, uh, and uh, political identity, uh, and then oh, uh, and then continuing the, the interest in the problem of race in American politics. Yes, that was in many ways unanticipated. I see myself now as a person whose scholarship has primarily been devoted to uh, the question of how uh, politics crafts political identities and statuses of different kinds, including racial and citizenship statuses. But that wasn't the way I thought of my work when I was in graduate school and in the first part of my career. Uh, instead, I turned to the study of citizenship after I completed uh, my first book because uh, there was a debate raging then uh, amongst historians and political theorists about whether uh, America had originally been more devoted to uh, what were seen as liberal conceptions of citizenship. The state exists primarily uh, to protect uh, individual private pursuits, economic pursuits, religious pursuits, et cetera, or whether uh, Americans had a more Republican conception of active um, civic service to the common good. And I thought if you looked at the history of citizenship laws carefully, you might be able to get a picture of how these different ideals manifested themselves and which were more predominant in different periods. But when I began looking at American citizenship laws, I found things that my education had not prepared me for, although my life experiences, uh, both in Illinois and South Carolina, had prepared me for it. And that was 
uh, that American citizenship laws uh, historically uh, were explicitly structured as systems of racial and gender hierarchy uh, through uh, most of U.S. history at that time for about 80 percent of U.S. history, most of the world's population regardless of how liberal or Republican their political beliefs were, they were ineligible for U.S. citizenship because of their uh, uh, race and ineligible for full citizenship uh, because of gender. And uh, uh, that elaboration of racial, gender, to some degree religious conceptions of American civic identity, I felt was not adequately captured in uh, the scholarship and teaching I'd been exposed to, and so it became my concern to uh, offer a different understanding of American political culture and American political development that showed that these were uh, central contributing features of American life to analyze why and to analyze where we might go, and that t did turn me into a scholar of race in America as well as a scholar of the construction of political identities more broadly. But before we uh, talk some more about uh, this intellectual uh, journey and, and look at a couple of your books, uh, let's talk a little about uh, doing political science and and relating that to, to how uh, your uh, uh, journey has uh, developed. Uh, what what are the the it, it, the quality of character and the the skills uh, that have to be developed to to do political theory? The I think that um, uh, you need a uh, sort of driving concern uh, with big political questions uh, in terms of character you have to have the uh, confidence to uh, do justice uh, to your own perspective. That is to say, uh, you're not going to be able to contribute to these issues unless you're honest with yourself about um, uh, what you think uh, is important that isn't being captured uh, in existing uh, perspectives. If you simply try to follow what other people are uh, saying, you're not going uh, to have anything distinctive uh, to contribute uh, to it. Uh, but I also think that scholarship in political theory, scholarship in general, the highest um, uh, responsibility is uh, uh, intellectual honesty, and it can be particularly challenging in political theory because um, uh, if you care about big questions and you care uh, about the distinctive things you have to say about them, there is uh, great pressure uh, to do scholarship that serves your normative agenda. Uh, and uh, you have to earn that. You have to earn that by being uh, tremendously conscientious about paying attention to all the arguments and evidence that speak against uh, what you uh, think you want to say. Uh, I think uh, some of my readers uh, uh, wish I were uh, uh, less attentive to uh, mountains of evidence in some of my work uh, than I am, particularly <laughs> in my very long book, uh, Civic Ideals, uh, but I feel that's part of the responsibility of the scholar. Now, now is it would seem that history uh, is important for someone doing the kind of work you're doing because, because uh, talk a little about that because one of the the traps of political science is to become so theoretical and so uh, self-consciously imitative of science that that they they lose sight of of real events and both in the past and the present? Yes. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, my thesis supervisor, Judith Schlar, uh, uh, surprised me um, uh, about early in my time working with her is that um, uh, uh, she said, you have a good uh, sense of history. And uh, uh, she didn't issue a lot of compliments. And uh, also, I didn't think I had a particularly uh, good sense of uh, history. Uh, and I came to realize that um, uh, what uh, she meant is that I uh, have always thought and continue to feel uh, that it is uh, at best a question whether we should understand uh, political science as uh, seeking um, uh, uh, relatively 
timeless patterns of regular behavior uh, in the way that uh, uh, some understandings of the natural sciences understand their goal uh, to be. Uh, it is a question uh, whether uh, human political behavior um, is uh, captured by the same fundamental regularities in all times and places, at least regularities that are not at such a high level of abstraction that they don't uh, illuminate very much. The only way you can consider whether that's true or not true is uh, to do a more historical political science uh, that looks at politics um, uh, over time and asks the questions, are we really finding um, uh, similar patterns? Are there fundamental transformations uh, that uh, make politics in one period very different than another? Uh, in a paper that you did for the, I think, the Social Science Research Council, you talked about what you saw as the, the tensions within uh, the disciplines, and, and one of those tensions was, uh, on the one hand, uh, political science seeing its mission in its history as being one of educating people for democracy and public affairs, uh, but then, on the other hand, uh, kind of a, a search for scientific truth. Uh, talk a little about that tension and how uh, it can be transcended, in a way, to do both. Uh, there are really a couple of tensions in terms of the intellectual mission of political science from its origins in the progressive era. Uh, its leaders always said, we're simply trying to find the truth about, the scientific truth about politics, let the chips fall where they may, and also uh, we're serving American democracy. Well, uh, it's possible that the scientific truth about um, uh, politics might discredit American democracy in some ways. So there is a potential tension there. Uh, one way uh, that the discipline resolved it is to say uh, that, well, we're not only seeking scientific truth about uh, politics, uh, we are, uh, through our teaching, disseminating greater political understanding, um, and uh, that greater understanding uh, is bound to help American democracy, even if some of our particular findings are disturbing for uh, uh, faith in American uh, democracy. Uh, but um, uh, it is a reality of especially uh, the last quarter century uh, that the, uh, the evolution of the modern American research university uh, has meant uh, that scholars are becoming more and more segregated into those uh, who do lots of research and very little teaching and those who do uh, lots and lots of teaching and have very little opportunity for uh, research. And uh, I think that uh, this is a, um, a damaging trend. I think uh, that uh, the public support uh, for our work uh, comes more for our teaching than our research, and that we do both our research and teaching better uh, if we are uh, doing both, and that done properly, uh, teaching about politics uh, helps resolve the teaching, the tension between uh, seeking scientific truth and um, uh, serving American democracy, because it is one of the good things about uh, the American public, in my view, that uh, they want teaching that um, uh, helps develop uh, understanding of a certain amount of political knowledge and also critical skills, critical uh, uh, reflective uh, skills, particularly at this moment in American politics. Uh, most people don't think everything is great, and they uh, want their kids to develop skills in critical thinking uh, that can help come up with uh, new answers, help them adapt with uh, changes uh, over time. Uh, so uh, I don't think uh, that there needs to be such a tension between the research and uh, teaching mission uh, or between uh, finding truth and making uh, a public contribution. Uh, but right now, I think uh, we are uh, experiencing difficulties in political science because these tensions are uh, pulling us uh, in different directions uh, instead of working together productively. Uh, when you were talking earlier about your intellectual journey, you, you brought us to the, to the uh, point uh, at which you dealt with this problem, which you cover in your book, Civic Ideals. 
and uh, uh, let's use that as a as a case study in in the way uh, a political scientist slash theorist uh, 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 works. Uh, interestingly enough, that uh, the the theory there, which we'll talk about in a minute, which you touched on, really uh, derives from a, a really looking at the history of. American laws on citizenship, uh, where you were working on one problem and then you discovered something else. So it's really a, a, a it can give us insight into sort of creativity, basically. T tell us about that journey. Uh, well, um, uh, fundamentally, uh, uh, I was looking for whether um, uh, American leaders uh, thought of citizenship more. Uh, as a matter of individual rights or private pursuits or active um, uh, public service, as I said, and I came across speeches like uh, Stephen uh, Douglas saying, um, uh, I believe this nation was made by the white man for the white man and that it should always be governed by the white man and not by uh, blacks or Indians or Asians or any other inferior race. This is what he said openly because it was the politically popular thing to say. Uh, and at that point, uh, I faced a choice of either um, not paying attention to the prevalence of this sort of discourse in American elections and American legislatures and by American courts through um, uh, at least the first two-thirds of our history uh, and instead focusing on the kind of themes that the scholarship was already featuring uh, or else I had to engage in some rethinking about, well, why did we have this discourse in a country that did have commitments to democracy and human rights? Why was it so politically uh, powerful? Um, and uh, what were the forces uh, contesting it as well as contributing to it? And so then I had a whole new scholarly agenda. And, and in, in what you were discovering, I guess, uh, seemed to, if not uh, contradict, then uh, well, shall we say, uh, help us understand theoretical ideas about America that were on the table. For example, Louis Hartz. So you were, with this data, uh, coming to a realization that, well, there are things not being addressed by uh, the the prevalent notions of what we are about as a as a people. Right, uh, Louis Hartz. Um, uh, uh, who also grew up in a different part of uh, the Midwest, uh, but was from an immigrant family. Uh, he uh, was, in the 1950s, especially uh, in the days of uh, McCarthy, uh, preoccupied uh, by the question of why Americans seem so hostile to socialist alternatives. And a lot of scholars, understandably, uh, in the Cold War years, uh, the question of socialism, capitalism, was uh, central to them, and therefore they tended to see it as central to uh, American political culture, and they interpreted American political development uh, fundamentally around the question of uh, why no socialism. Uh, those perspectives kept issues of civil rights at the margins, uh, at most um, uh, presented in terms of, well, uh, uh, were there um, uh, leftovers of pre-capitalist systems that meant that some people resisted um, uh, embracing equal rights, or uh, uh, is it uh, fundamentally, as uh, communists said, uh, in the mid-20th century, American capitalism that is responsible uh, for racial inequalities? Um, they had trouble making both those arguments work, and so mostly they kept these issues uh, to the margins, and that's why the discipline of political science uh, had little to say about the rise of the modern civil rights movement. Now, that began to change in the late 60s and 1970s. You couldn't ignore uh, the importance of civil rights struggles in American politics anymore, uh, and the scholarship uh, began to change. But uh, when I was uh, first writing on these themes uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was still a dominant scholarly concern to see how can we encompass uh, these uh, struggles over race uh, without changing our dominant pictures and models too much. And I was pushing uh, for more uh, substantial change. There was a lot of resistance. Most of my early articles were rejected by journals in the discipline and uh, uh, 
uh, I didn't have tenure, so that was very disturbing, but uh, and, I persisted. And, and so so that, that really what in this evidence, that, uh, this gold mine of evidence that opened up for you, 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 you really found again and again the exceptions to what we perceived as the general rule about who we were. Exactly. The, um, uh, the more I looked, um, I found that uh, in area after area of the law, in area after area of political discourse, uh, there was plenty of talk about individual rights. There was plenty of talk about Republican self-governance, but there was also plenty of talk uh, about uh, race, gender, about America as a Christian nation, et cetera. And uh, so that uh, what was presented in the models on which I'd been educated as marginal uh, instead appeared to be, um, uh, uh, have a much more central place in the overall frame. Not the only things going on, but equally as important as uh, many of the other things uh, that had been uh, stressed. And so then uh, the challenge uh, became to see how all those things fit together. I want to note, though, that even though the fact that people weren't buying my argument meant that I just kept piling up more and more evidence and finding more and more evidence. And so I thought I could say this isn't the exception. This is a central uh, dimension of American experience. This is a, uh, these are robust American traditions. Um, I found lots of evidence, and that was ultimately important. Um, uh, it was actually only when I went back through the text of Louis Hartz, uh, the text of Tocqueville that he built on, uh, Gunnar Myrdal and other influential writers, and said, look, here are particulars of their accounts that just aren't persuasive because they haven't paid enough attention or they uh, have made unpersuasive arguments about uh, race and gender, uh, et cetera. Um, it's only when I not only provided the evidence but also directly criticized the iconic models uh, that political scientists uh, began to pay attention. <laughs> so so what, what you were seeing was that the kind of, the, when, when the tire... Uh, uh, hits the road when the ideals uh, 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 have to be addressed by in in real political time with realities on the ground. That it, it, it's still about building coalitions and that leaders often uh, uh, adjust to vested interests uh, in areas like citizenship that lead them to draw lines that demonstrate that our perfect ideals are not realized in fact for some people. <laughs> yes, actually my position is more radical than that. Okay. Uh, you're right, it's about building coalitions, but it's not that the leaders have high ideals, uh, but to build coalitions they have to make concessions uh, with some people whose ideals they don't like. Uh, it is rather that we have had more ideals contending uh, to govern America than we like to acknowledge. Uh, Stephen Douglas, uh, in running against Abraham uh, Lincoln, uh, Andrew Jackson, in getting rid of the Indians, Woodrow Wilson, in segregating uh, the federal uh, uh, civil service, they were not making concessions um, to those uh, who had nasty beliefs that they didn't accept. They believed America was supposed to be a white man's nation. That was part of their civic ideals. And it is true that because so many Americans have been invested in these ideals of America, that in building coalitions, you have to take them into account. And even politicians who don't embrace them fully, like Lincoln uh, himself, uh, his speeches make concessions to the white supremacist notions of his day. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the reason that those concessions are necessary are in part because lots of American leaders, as well as other Americans, actually believe in these uh, uh, racial, gender, religious, hierarchical uh, notions of American identity. Well, historically. They Historically, but it, this sounds very relevant for our times, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, in, in your other work, you have a book on uh, 
where you're, you're looking at nation building uh, on peoplehood, I think you call it. What the exact title of the book? Stories of Peoplehood, peoplehood. Encompasses Nations and Other Forms of Political Community. And, and, and what, what you're arguing there, as I understand it, is that, that leaders talk to people with narratives right. that help to build a sense of political com community, and the, the leaders both help shape that community, but they have to find that community. The community has to be there. Uh, is, it, does that, it, does that, uh, is that a fair rendering? Help me, help me understand. That's because close. I think uh, finding goes too far to imply that the community is somehow uh, already really there. The, uh, in an effort to understand uh, the uh, construction of American civic identity and civic ideals, I had to think more generally about, well, what are the processes uh, through which um, uh, census of uh, common political identity um, come to be? Uh, and I um, endorsed the view now that's uh, widespread, I think rightly, in modern social sciences and humanities, uh, that there is no political community that is simply there, that is uh, simply natural, and there is no political community that is uncontested in the sense uh, that um, those who are members of what are recognized as existing political communities uh, also uh, are products of uh, historical experiences that mean uh, that they have a sense of multiple potential identities and allegiances, and there are always people willing to try and mobilize them uh, in a different direction uh, than the uh, community commitments they already have. So uh, the argument of uh, that book is that more than political scientists have recognized, it is a central continuing task of political leaders always to tell stories that help uh, inspire people to think they should embrace the sense of political community and the leadership that those leaders are uh, putting forward. Now, they can't succeed if they don't tell stories that resonate with people. So they do have to build on the pre-existing pre census of identity, uh, the pre-existing economic interests, uh, the pre-existing ideologies uh, or faiths that people have. Um, they have to build those, uh, draw on those elements and put them into uh, a story uh, that can uh, persuade people uh, to uh, embrace that political community and effect to be part of a coalition to sustain it. And of course, they want that coalition to be one that not only uh, embraces the political community, but embraces those leaders as the people uh, who should be in charge of it. Uh, it. It would seem useful at this point to maybe compare some of our leaders. And, and let, let's talk a little about Lincoln at first, because he clearly, in over time, the time of his career in dealing with slavery, really came up with a new definition of the community. Yes, uh, Lincoln uh, redefined the American story as one in which the American people had uh, created themselves as a people uh, dedicated to realizing the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's not that that was never suggested before, but Lincoln is the one who made that central to the American understanding. The Declaration of Independence in the eyes of the courts does not really have any specific legal force. It's the Constitution that's authoritative. But Lincoln said we should interpret the Constitution as a set of structures designed to help us over time progressively realize the purposes of the Declaration of Independence. His own understanding of those purposes evolved. When he first articulated this view in 1854, he said, and the principles of the Declaration of Independence mean government by the consent of the governed. That was the sheet anchor of American republicanism. Well. That was a problematic position for him because it appeared to imply uh, that um, African Americans who were governed should be enfranchised. And uh, he wasn't prepared to push for that either politically or personally. It would have uh, uh, been disastrous. I don't think at that point in his life he was prepared to embrace it. So he reinterpreted his story to say, we are dedicated to realizing the principles of the Declaration of Independence, and those principles are that everybody should enjoy the basic rights of life, liberty, and free labor, the right to the fruit of your own labor. That meant slavery 
was against the principles of Declaration of Independence. It did not clearly require enfranchisement uh, and equal uh, citizenship, uh, but he understood the Constitution uh, and the American people as devoted to a historic quest over time uh, to realize the principles of Declaration of Independence more fully for Americans and ultimately for all the world, uh, he said. And I think that that story, um, uh, he uh, sort of perfected it in his own mind as he went along and he eventually concluded it did mean you had to support black enfranchisement uh, amongst other things. Um, it, he also, uh, uh, the example and the very difficult but ultimately um, uh, successful uh, transformations that his administration wrought uh, in America through the Civil War, uh, that uh, made this story that we are the people of the Declaration of Independence seeking to fulfill it um, uh, a much more central story uh, in American political experience and development than it was before. Reagan, let's look at Reagan because, because Reagan, uh, in retrospect, it's very clear that, that he uh, took the American narrative to a new place that, that in a way, uh, harkened back to sort of liberal notions of uh, the, the, the individual uh, freed from the constraints of the state but, but able to participate in the market. Uh, it, it, help me with that, in other words. What, 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 uh, what, was that his contribution? What else was he saying? Uh, you're absolutely right that that was uh, the kind of story he told, but there is um, uh, a fascinating development that I think contributed to Reagan's political success. Uh, uh, from the time uh, he uh, began speaking out politically, uh, uh, he was primarily anti-communism, pro-free enterprise at home. But that took him so far. Uh, when uh, the um, uh, various conservative groups began forming um, um, coalitions and holding meetings in the 1970s, he began regularly giving uh, annual speeches uh, uh, to the um, conservative convention. And uh, beginning in the early 1970s, uh, he hit on a new way of putting his story that became more and more dominant in his rhetoric over time, and that is um, uh, he seized on the story of uh, John Winthrop on the uh, Arabella uh, giving a sermon which said uh, that um, uh, the uh, new uh, uh, Puritan colony would be as a city on a hill. And from then on, uh, Reagan told the story of America's anti-communist free enterprise system uh, as uh, the story of a nation that had a kind of providential mission to be the light of liberty to the world. And this meant that by 1980, Reagan was able to add to the economic conservatives uh, the emerging uh, uh, religious right movement in American politics as part of a common coalition that along with uh, military conservatives um, uh, uh, proved uh, broad enough to uh, become predominant in American politics over the next generation. And it's America as a city on a hill, but a city on a hill uh, devoted to free enterprise uh, and personal liberty. That's the Reagan story. So, so interestingly enough, in, in, a, in a funny kind of way, uh, our leaders, uh, part of their task is to be a storyteller yes. that picks up uh, strands of stories that are, have already been told, but constantly uh, reorganizing them or adding new elements to essentially then have the coalition to actually get elected and then run the government. That's exactly right. Um, uh, the one further stage is uh, that while you need to build a broad enough coalition uh, to uh, govern, um, uh, to get power uh, and govern, uh, number one, even though you might want a really broad coalition, you can't include everybody because some of your core constituents don't want the agenda of other people to be part of your agenda. So you, you have to make some choices. That also means that when you do come to power, uh, there's still going to be rival powers. You don't have total power. And uh, so uh, it shouldn't be understood 
that the story you use to build the coalition and to guide your policies simply gets implemented in pure form in your policies and institutional innovations. Uh, there are always compromises, and uh, uh, those compromises become the overall structure of governance of policies and institutions, and then those have consequences um, uh, changing life in ways that shape uh, what new coalitions are formed and what new stories are told. So, so basically, you, you have to be an acrobat on a high wire combining, you know, having in the one hand the narrative, but on the other hand making real policies that, that may in part be inconsistent to, to, the, to uh, the other part of your act. Yeah, one of Ronald Reagan's political skills not adequately recognized, um, uh, I think not even fully self-consciously acknowledged by himself, was uh, that as an old actor uh, who knew he didn't want to lose his audience, although he had a very strong story, a very strong uh, political ideology and tried hard to remain uh, true to it, if you look at his um, actual governance, uh, you'll see uh, he made departures and accommodations uh, to avoid alienating people too much over and over again. Uh, that's something uh, that some of the um, uh, those who look to him today uh, have lost sight of. They treat him as more uh, pure ideologue than he was in practice. Obama, yes. how does he fit into this story of the leaders who have narratives uh, uh, to win the vote? Obama is probably more conscious of the tasks of political storytelling uh, than most leaders, and he has um, uh, uh, he launched himself into national prominence with his 2004 uh, speech, uh, uh, which was designed to merge his personal story with his version of the national story. And his story is uh, that the uh, uh, America's special feature uh, and special mission uh, is e pluribus unum, uh, out of many one, that we find ways to uh, achieve common agreements and pursue common goals without effacing our diversity. He presented himself. I have one of the most diverse backgrounds uh, uh, imaginable, uh, but I'm wholly uh, committed to America, my very diverse uh, uh, family. We find ways uh, uh, to love and work together and help each other. All Americans uh, can do that. Um, in his speech in Cairo to the Muslim world early in his term, uh, he did an interesting variation of Lincoln, who'd said in the Gettysburg Address that this nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Obama said this nation uh, was founded on the principle that all people are equal and dedicated to e pluribus unum, to achieving unity despite uh, diversity. And uh, uh, Obama's story, uh, which was inspiring uh, during the campaign, uh, in a nation that felt deeply divided and polarized was that uh, he was the guy uh, that could get people of very different views uh, to come together, find common ground, help solve common problems, and uh, move uh, forward. Uh, and he always says, um, for those who refuse to do this, that's not who we are as Americans. He makes this the American story. Uh, we overcome differences, e pluribus unum. Now, now, his problem today is a very different one. So let, let's look at uh, the elements of the American gridlock, paralysis, fragmentation, whatever you want to call it, that, that exists today. And, and we have to identify uh, two central problems. One is, uh, uh, as a result of the Reagan Revolution, the, the, the stark inequality that has emerged. I mean, that's clear. Uh, to everybody except certain factions, obviously, uh, the, the, the threat that that poses. And then the, the second is America's relative decline uh, in the world. So, so uh, as somebody who studied narratives and also looked at the way our ideals uh, aren't totally realized because some of the vested interests uh, and, and the way they work their way through legislation and other means. What, 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 talk a little about that problem and what, it, the, those two problems and how they, what they pose for the American narrative and for political leadership, because President Obama seems to be having a lot of trouble. 
Yes, well, on the first point, uh, it's just um, uh, empirically undeniable uh, that American economic inequalities have uh, expanded to uh, uh, the greatest extent that we've uh, known in our history uh, since the late 19th century um, and maybe uh, through the uh, 1920s there was a diminishing of inequality from the New Deal through the uh, great society um, on up to Reagan. Uh, there's been a great uh, expansion ever since. We are profoundly divided about what to do about that. Um, uh, people uh, at the upper end uh, think there's nothing wrong with that. It's consistent with economic growth uh, for all. A lot of people don't feel they're sharing in that economic uh, growth. Uh, it has proven that um, uh, Obama's efforts uh, to achieve e pluribus unum uh, by brokering compromises on economic policies, uh, he just hasn't succeeded. And so uh, there is a question now of whether we uh, need a politics uh, that rather than simply seeking unity through compromise, does uh, mobilize part of the population uh, to get predominant power on uh, the part of one set of policies and solutions um, uh, in order to break gridlock. And part of Obama's um, uh, challenge at this moment uh, is whether uh, he can mobilize uh, broader support um, instead of just being uh, the uh, leader of reasonable compromise as the w in the way that he uh, has always tried to be. Uh, these issues do connect uh, with America's uh, relative decline in the world. It's still the world's largest economy. It's still by far uh, the world's overwhelmingly um, powerful military nation. Uh, but um, it is true that the growth of American inequality uh, has uh, been achieved through the expansion of our financial sector uh, and the relocation of most of our manufacturing uh, uh, overseas uh, to other countries uh, who are now outproducing us and whose um, uh, economies are proving uh, uh, better founded for growth than this, um, uh, I think, unduly finance-centered uh, economy uh, that we have developed. So that has contributed to our national decline. And this proposes, or this poses tremendous problems for Obama, who already has a tension in that um, uh, his American story of e pluribus unum uh, points to all of us embracing American identity. But what does that mean when you deal in international affairs uh, in which everyone doesn't accept that what's good for America is the common good? Well, his answer has been to say, uh, well, actually, e pluribus unum is my global philosophy, too, and I'm going to work multilaterally and consensually and achieve compromises that are good for uh, other countries. But in a period of perceived American relative decline, then for a lot of the Americans where he said, I was going to bring you together and benefit America, he can be seen as selling out America uh, to uh, all these other countries, not standing up for it uh, enough. Um, uh, it was helpful to him in this regard uh, that uh, he did succeed in commanding the operation that killed Osama bin Laden, uh, and that showed you know, America was still uh, tough and effective uh, in the world. Uh, but uh, that's not nearly enough to uh, satisfy uh, his critics who say, oh, he always goes around apologizing for America. He's too multilateralist. He's not standing up for us uh, enough. Um, and I think that American interests are served by multilateral policies uh, in many respects. But the political challenge of having a story that persuades the American people that their interests are best served by those uh, policies, that is a uh, very daunting challenge, and I don't think uh, anyone is meeting it right now. And, and is, is part of the problem here that he's losing uh, the coalition or finding the coalition or creating the coalition that would, um, that would tie him to a narrative that would then resonate with the people? Is that, does that sort of flow from your other arguments? Yes, his coalition uh, is both losing people and people that are still going to vote, their, vote for him. Now they're saying they're going to hold their noses and vote for the, him, and they may not turn out. You know, they're not going to vote for uh, his opponent, but they're not going to turn out. Uh, it is fundamentally the failure 
to uh, reach agreement on economic policies uh, that could produce uh, substantial job growth. Now, I think Obama uh, can uh, truthfully claim that he may have averted a depression. Um, his predecessor saw job loss. He has seen some job growth, but it's very limited job growth um, and with uh, wages stagnant or declining for many Americans. And that failure to achieve economic success um, has made many independents give up on him, and it is demoralizing uh, for many in his uh, base. And so his coalition uh, is uh, vulnerable. Uh, the Republicans face the task of building an opposing coalition, and that is daunting for them, too. But Obama has problems. Your new book, uh, Still a House, Divided Race and Politics in Obama's America, with Desmond, written with Desmond S. King, uh, really uh, is, is interesting at two levels. One, it, it's, it's telling us why the, the problem of race endures. But it's tying that to where our political system is. And uh, it, it's, it's really a, a dark picture of a system that is polarized. Uh, talk about that, because what it's suggesting more broadly is the state of that system means that you're not going to get the kind of compromises and working solutions to this problem we always confront of making our ideals real. Yes. Uh, there are um, unhappy ironies uh, in abundance here. Our argument is uh, that American politics uh, has always generated some central battleground racial issues. Slavery, and then after it was ended, uh, eventually the new issue emerged. Jim Crow segregation, and after it was ended, eventually new issues emerged in the modern uh, era. Uh, the modern issues are whether uh, racial policies uh, should um, include uh, race-targeted and race-conscious measures in which you decide policies on the basis of whether they will reduce racial inequalities or not, or whether it's better to have colorblind policies rather than uh, inflaming senses of uh, racial identity and, and difference. That's uh, the modern debate. Uh, uh, the first irony is that um, through much of American history, the two political parties were divided internally over slavery, over Jim Crow, and so they sought not to uh, contest over those policies, but really uh, to keep them off the agenda uh, or to compromise them uh, because uh, they didn't want to be torn apart internally uh, over what to do about slavery or Jim Crow. Uh, their tendency not to address those issues um, meant that those um, inexcusable American uh, institutions endured far longer than they should. The distinctive feature of the modern era is that uh, today the racial policy coalitions uh, for race conscious or race or colorblind policies, they are almost fully identified with the two major parties. The Democratic platform since 1972 have always called for some forms of affirmative action. Uh, Republican platforms always denounce um, uh, uh, quotas and uh, uh, call for colorblind uh, policies. Uh, so now the parties are more sharply opposed over racial policy issues. And uh, that contributes to the more general polarization of American politics. Um, it also contributes to uh, a couple of things. Um, the uh, uh, parties uh, increasingly have not argued about racial policy issues much at all, even though they still have their official positions, because the Democrats know their positions are less popular uh, with the predominantly white American electorate, and so they don't emphasize them because they're not emphasizing them. The Republicans don't have them to attack. So uh, for different reasons than in the past, we have the uh, parties avoiding uh, actually talking about racial policy issues very much. Even Obama himself, in his celebrated National Constitution Center speech on race during the campaign after the Reverend Wright controversy, he talked about racial feelings, but not about racial policies. And it's also true that because we don't talk about racial policies, we don't seek to achieve 
what uh, we think are a range of reasonable compromises between more race conscious and colorblind measures. Uh, again, the irony is it was wrong to seek compromise over slavery. It was wrong to seek compromise over Jim Crow segregation. Uh, we think it's right to seek compromise over um, how race conscious or colorblind our policies should be. We should choose what policies will be most effective both in reducing racial uh, gaps and benefiting all Americans. And some of those uh, uh, will be uh, fully colorblind. Some might be colorblind policies, but chosen for their good racial consequences. There's lots of room for compromise. We have uh, our first black president who's devoted to compromise, but the system is incapable of achieving compromise because we don't talk about racial, racial policy issues at all. And when we do, it's in tired repeats of these two sharply polarized positions that have come to structure modern debate. So, so bringing your, your focus on uh, political theory and understanding American ideals, but also grounded in a sense of coalitions and the actual working out of politics, is there a, is there a path that you see to get the U.S. out of, of its predicament? If I had a path that I was really confident um, would get us out of our uh, predicament, um, I would uh, uh, probably uh, not be having this conversation, but would be uh, in Washington trying to uh, uh, persuade people. Uh, I don't think I have all the answers. Again, my life experience has been that uh, when I think I do have all the answers, I better rethink. Um, I will say this, that uh, it is important to understand that both the modern racial policy coalitions, the colorblind folks and the race conscious, race targeted folks, see themselves as the true heirs of the modern civil rights movement. They don't attack it, they celebrate it as part of the American story. The colorblind people quote Martin Luther King saying uh, that we should judge people not on the color of their skin but the content of their character. Uh, the race conscious people quote Martin Luther King in the same speech as saying America owes a promissory note uh, to those uh, it has uh, mistreated and so it has responsibilities to uh, assist them. And the fact that we have now a nation that um, uh, through much of our history had politicians that openly spoke of racial white supremacy as an American ideal, the fact that we now embrace with different interpretations, the civil rights movement, the end of segregation, the battle for racial equality as a central element of our American story across the spectrum. This is something we should be able to build on to uh, say, look, we share commitments to finding ways to assist everyone while reducing racial equality. That is a central part of the American story as we've decided to develop it uh, over time. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, if we have uh, political leaders who have the courage and also the wisdom to see the opportunity uh, in emphasizing these elements of the American story, uh, we have the potential to go forward. But it means they need to talk about racial policies, and right now, none of them think it's safe to do that. Well, on that uh, uh, note, uh, Professor uh, Smith, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to be here today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us this conversation with history.